So for many startups, um, they never even exceed in the first months um, the amount of free capacity that we provide you with. That's pretty much what all the serverless vendors out there, out there provide you with, but we are a little bit different because we are entirely based on an Apache-hosted open source project, which is being called OpenRisk, which we as IBMers initially launched and still lead, but together with partners from Adobe and Red Hat, and they are all focusing on some different aspects. So the Red Hat guys, for example, are focusing on doing all the Kubernetes integration and stuff like that. And due to the fact that we are based on um, open source, we reduce the risk of any kind of vendor lock-in tremendously. So that means if you one day don't like us anymore, which is a completely unrealistic scenario, but let's assume it, then you can just go to our GitHub repository, can download the engine, can install it on your own infrastructure, suffer by managing it the same way we suffer from using, from using our own infrastructure, or you can even install it on the competitor's uh, infrastructure, which is again not a recommendation of what you should do, but in theory it would be possible. So this is what we are, or where we are, um, and now I want to focus on something um, that is one of our recent additions. So at the beginning of serverless computing, we have all been talking about these general values, which you have already heard and learned about, um, like getting rid of managing infrastructure, paying only for what is being used, and developing single functions. But there is a new trend, and the trend is that we are seeing is there is a shift towards developing way more complex applications, serverless applications, by stitching together multiple functions along with control logic and state. And that's simply because developers want to develop way more complex, entirely serverless applications, still having all these benefits that serverless provides them with, but being, for example, able to develop workflow applications, but without the need to deploy a full-blown workflow engine. That's not what they want to do. They want to have an entirely serverless architecture. And the solution is what we call the composer, because the composer satisfies exactly this need, which means it provides you with a new programming model that allows you to compose individual functions into larger applications. And we do so by providing you access to uh, a couple of fun functions or methods that you can use to stitch together your, um, your solution. So you, for example, you can have a sequence, you can um, have an uh, if condition, you can have a loop, you can define try-catch clauses, all these things. But I do not want to bore you with all these slides, I just show you how it works. And the first thing I do is something very, very simple. Um, I, I define an if statement. And the if statement is comprised of three actions. The first action is called the login action, the second action is called the success action, and the third one is the failure action. Something very, very simple. Um, and the login action is then just checking if the password that I've handed over equals to my given name. If it does, it returns true. If it doesn't, it returns false. And if the condition evaluates to true, then the success action is being executed, which then gives me a message like success. And if it evaluates to false, the failure action is being executed, which responds with failure. Something very, very complex, right? So I just deploy the actions, the three actions that are part of this if statement, and then I deploy the application itself, which stitches together all these little actions. That's what I do here. And then before I execute it, um, I, let, I use a tool that we have, we call it the FISH tool, FSH, to preview what I've just programmed. That's a very nice tool so that you can see if what you have programmed is really what you need to do. So I do it like this, and then I get a graphical representation of what I've defined, and I see, okay, I've defined something where I first have a login action. If the login evaluates to true, I go to the success action. If the login evaluates to false, I go to the failure action. So that's pretty much what I want to do. And now I execute it by just calling this application and first handing over a wrong password, of course. So first I hand over Alexander, and now what I get is uh, I get the message failure just as we have expected, and now I just do it again. Um, and what I then do, I hand over the determined rears and I get success. 
That's a very, very simple example what you can do to stitch together things. So, but let me show something a little bit more complex. And what I do, I have a little application like this. So what it allows you to do is, you send the SMS to Twilio, where I have a registered number, and once the SMS is being received, um, a composition is being called, and if the text that was part of the SMS was in English, it's being translated to Yoda English. So may the force be with you. If it's not in English, it's being translated to English. So that's what it does, very simple. Uh, and I just show you how this works. So I've already deployed all the artifacts, all the actions are already there. So I do what I've just done before, now just a little bit more complex solution. So you get a visualization of what I've programmed. And you see the composition starts here and the first thing I do is I have an action that is called the language ID. And the language ID action uses Watson identification servers to detect if the string that was handed over is English or not. If it's English, it switches over to, here you see what I do. So this action um, just checks, okay, was this English, was this Danish, was this German, something like that. And then I get back a response with some confidence that this was a particular language. And if it was uh, not English, I go to the translator action. The translator action uses the Watson translation servers to translate from non-English to English. And if it was English, it flips to the Yoda uh, a translator, which is one of these fun translation APIs being out there, and then, so it's just available under funtranslations.com, it's being translated to Yoda English. So let me just, um, and then at the end, the SMS is being sent back to the guy who has initially sent the SMS with some English text or some non English text. So I used my mobile phone at home uh, using AirDroid, and then I just um, send a message to my Twilio number, and I used German, which is obviously not English, saying, um, hello, wie geht es dir? And since this is not English, um, it's being translated to English. So I go to pass where I translate to English using all the Watson services, and it's saying, yep, hello, how are you doing? So I'm composing a complex application comprised of multiple actions using this orchestration tool. And the second example then is I use English text which then means it's not being translated to English, it's being translated to uh, Yoda English. So I say, hello Israel, how is the weather? Pretty hot, but that's something Watson doesn't know. Um, and the response I get is, let's see. Force be with you, Israel. The weather, how is? So that's a good example of what you can do using all these programming, programming constructs to stitch together your functions to make something very, very complex. If you want to see more, we have a booth out there. Just come, come step by, and now I hand over with one minute delay to Vadim, who has to rush a little bit now to show all the challenges we have to solve as uh, being a vendor. Um, so let's first start with a question. What does it mean to be a serverless vendor? Uh, you could uh, think of it as being a uh, a parking lot. On a parking lot, you typically have different types of cars. The ones who wants to park for a longer period of time, the ones who wants to stay for a really short one. And you could also think of it as the users who comes there with a big, huge trucks, and the users who come with the small cars. And you also need to think as the, uh, as the owner of the uh, parking lot, about the latency, how long do, do your users need to wait for the free space to be there for you? And also you need to take care that there are free spaces after all. So basically you could think, so if you put it into the technical terms, you could think of serverless being split into five dimensions. Of course you could think of more dimensions than five. Uh, so basically it goes to the action duration, how long your action takes to run, it could be a really short running action, which runs within some milliseconds, or a long running one, which goes up, uh, up to five or even 10 minutes. Uh, that the, the, the second dimension is a throughput, how many actions you could run in parallel. That could be also, the, the workload could be also, it could vary from customer to customer. Some customers, they prefer a couple of parallel actions, while the other ones, they want to have uh, 10,000 parallel actions. Uh, 
you could also think of the latency because uh, 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 there are certain use cases of serverless as, uh, um, such as IoT or mobile backends where you require the latency in terms of seconds or even milliseconds. And there are also customers who uh, use a really compute intense operations such as uh, a CPU or memory bound operations. But we will just focus on two of them in this presentation. It's the, uh, it's, the, uh, it's the throughput and the duration of the action. And to be more precise, we will just think of a scenario of having uh, a certain serverless action which, is, uh, which uh, consumes lots of resources and, and, it is, and it requires lots of throughput. So the one thing that I want you to, uh, that I want you to, uh, to remember from this presentation is that you need to know your users if you have uh, a, serverless, uh, a serverless platform. So usually people go on stage and they talk about the really good, really, really proud customers, that they are really proud of them. But no one tries to talk about, but no one wants to talk about the customers, especially the ones who want to break your system. So today we are going to talk about such kind of customers. And to be more precise, we are going to talk about the ones who are called Bitcoin miners or Monero miners. And uh, there are many customers uh, who are doing such, uh, such kind of anti-pattern on, on uh, serverless platforms. And uh, they are trying to, so they are basically trying to uh, use the whole resources of uh, your system in order to uh, do a single computation, in order to mine the Bitcoin. Next slide. Um, so as you know, so or maybe don't know, it takes about 435 years to compute one Bitcoin. So it's, it's, uh, it's totally insane to do such kind of computation. So that's why they need all the resources and they are trying to occupy the whole system. Uh, and we had one story, or basically not one story, but a series of stories. And the story began with the fact that uh, some guys, they have started to put their malicious code into the Docker image. They have packed the Docker image, pushed it to Docker Hub, and they started to pull it. We were able to identify that, and uh, we have we we uh, we have implemented some tooling uh, in order to detect such images. And we were pretty happy at that time that we have fixed that problem. But it didn't last for longer because after some time they came up with a new solution. And one of our developers, it has to wake up at four in the morning and he got an alert and he looked into the system and, uh, and he realized that the whole system was a crap. Uh, the system was really slow, the customers had to wait, the queue was up to several thousand requests, which meant that no, no, uh, 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 someone else who could enter your platform, it will be waiting for several minutes, basically, for, uh, for their actions. Next. Uh, so basically, what the customer did, it just it just created thousands of of um, uh, thousands of uh, several accounts which were registered on the disposable email addresses, and it, uh, and it has also changed the pattern from using the binary to using a Node.js code, which was Base64 encoded, and at that time we were not able to identify that, but after that we have learned it and we do not allow the disposable email addresses anymore, and we also do the check of the code. Uh, but basically what I'm trying to say is that you will be always vulnerable to such kind of attacks because, thank you, uh, because they will always come up with a new pattern, uh, with a new way to break your system, not to break your system basically, but to get into the system and to try to, uh, to do the Bitcoin mining. And they could, for example, use the Base64 encoding in Base64 and Base64 in a loop. Or uh, they could just use some uh, funny, funny string interpolation. They could, uh, they could split the big string into the, some chunks. They could revert it. They could encode it. Or they could do some uh, funny manipulation with the URLs where they download the links, for the, the, the binaries from. So, uh, but does it mean that we are always vulnerable to such kind of attacks? Um, I think we are not, because we, we always could try our best and to put several lines of defense in this field, in this battlefield, 
And you could say that you are doing the check of the customers when they register to your platform. First, you check their credit card, for example, or you do the two-step verification. Or, and then when the customer is on the platform, you are checking their code, what is the binary or what is, uh, what is the source code, and you are scanning for the, some malicious patterns, basically. Uh, and then when the customer is running your code, the code on the platform, you could also do some, uh, some runtime verification, what kind of uh, binary it is, uh, uh, is running, what kind of ports are open, what kind of uh, ports uh, are, being, are being pinged, and so on. So basically, uh, what I'm trying to say is that, let me just summarize this short talk. You need to know your user and you basically need to limit your user reasonably and you need to uh, think of different ways of users misusing your platform. Um, next one. So that's basically it. If you would like to know more about OpenWhisk or about functions in general, please visit one of the links which I depicted here. Uh, you could even contact us on Slack or by any other means on the next slide. So that was it. Thank you very much.